two with one of my favorite guests, D. Orlando Ledbetter, longtime Falcons beat writer for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, AJC.com. He f- joins us every Thursday for the Falcons report. And uh, gosh, uh, it's been mostly bad news this year. Uh, Orlando and that continued this past uh, Sunday out in Arizona. The Falcons uh, let another one get away. And uh, 34-33, Matt Bryant misses an extra point that would have tied the game. But let's be honest, uh, again, if you're, if you're going to be a good football team in this league, uh, Arizona is one of the teams you got to beat. It probably shouldn't come down to an extra point. But once again, the Falcons' defense, in, in one of the better games for Matt Ryan this season, the Falcons' defense was atrocious again. Yeah, no question about it, Gary. They, uh, you know, allowed five scores to uh, start the game. Somehow got three stops there so they can get back into it. But uh, even one of those stops was shaky as uh, Beryl Cooper dropped the ball when he had the first down. So. Uh, whatever, whatever's going on on that side of the ball, uh, they don't seem to have a good uh, clue of how they're supposed to play their zone defense, and, and uh, teams are exploiting it. Well, you got an interesting piece out this morning, by the way, folks. Follow or if you're a Falcons fan, follow Orlando on Twitter at d orlando ajc. It's been 242 defensive snaps since the Falcons had a sack. That is just unbelievable. And Vic Beasley, who came up. Um, a few years ago and looked like he was going to be one of the best pass rushers in the league. He's never he's never been able to duplicate his early career success. McKinley's been a disappointment rushing from the other side. This has got to change. I mean, somehow, some some way, you've occasionally got to put the quarterback in this league on the ground, don't you? Yeah, no question about it. Yeah, Beasley won the Deacon Jones Award, which goes to the league's top sacker. And 16 with 15.5 sacks. He hasn't been past five sacks since. Uh, uh, won't, won't add a move. He kind of uh, is looking back. It was really bad, a front and a bad look, and maybe part of the disconnect of the team when Coach Quinn says he wants to work with him and help him, and uh, he decides he doesn't want to do that over the off season, you know. And uh, Coach Quinn said, hey, you can't keep doing the same thing, getting the same results. Lo and behold, he's still trying to do the same thing and getting the same results. So, uh, you know, they, they elected to keep him. I don't think. Uh, they'll keep him much past this year, and uh, maybe even with the tread line, deadline coming up, he might, uh, you know, they might want to see what they can get for it. All right, reality is the Falcons are one in five, and and it's quickly slipping away from them the entire season. And when you look at the schedule, what's so disappointing is is, you know, they got tougher games to go. They're about to get into division play, but I mean, you look at at the Minnesota loss. Hey, Minnesota at home, they're going to be a lot of people. They came back and beat the Eagles. You felt like the Colts was a winnable game in Indianapolis to let that one slip away. Certainly, you got to beat the Titans at home. Nothing wrong with losing to the Texans, uh, but at worst, this team should be three and three. And the fact that you're one and five, you think this is too big a hole to climb out of? Uh, uh, yeah, Gary. I went back. It's only been three teams to do this uh, to come out of the one and five hole and make the playoffs, and one of them doesn't count because it was the Cincinnati Bengals back in uh, back in 1970. So. Uh, you know, that didn't count. The 2015 Chiefs, uh, that was, uh, you know, uh, Andy Reid and them, they went 11-5. and five. And then last year, the Colts were able to do it. But they had good defenses. And we, we see the Falcons don't have a good defense. And uh, it's going to be hard for them to get on the road like that. Next up, uh, the Rams. And they come to Atlanta this Sunday. And this is a, a Los Angeles team now that's reeling a little bit and has question marks of its own. Going into the season, we thought the Rams were one of the premier teams in the league, but they've lost three in a row. Can the Falcons get off the snide somehow in this game Saturday? I mean, Sunday? I think so. They got a shot, Gary, because uh, the Rams are, are reeling. They're readjusting their whole secondary. They're going to try to slide Jalen Ramsey out there. Uh, they got some young corners. Uh, their strong safety just went on IR. So, but, I mean, they got Aaron Donald. Uh, Jalen Ramsey and Eric Whittle to just kind of go out there and go for it with. Uh, so so that's good. Gurley's supposed to play. I talked to Coach McVay yesterday, and he said Gurley was back limited yesterday, and he's on his uh, on pace to play. So they will have, you know, their main weapon back, and, and that's going to make it tough on the Falcons. But uh, at some point, they got to – I don't know if they're just this bad or – are they making that many mistakes? I'm, I'm starting to lean toward they're, they're, they're just not very good on defense. 
Of course, Sean McVay, this is a homecoming for him. One of the NFL's uh, wonder boys took the Falcons, or took the Rams, I should say, to the Super Bowl last year. Uh, how big is this game, do you think, for Sean McVay? Uh, Sean wants it. Uh, you know, last time here, he didn't do so well in the Super Bowl. Uh, you know, knew him back in high school with him and Calvin Johnson were the hot recruits uh, coming out of school. And uh, so Sean's been fun to watch his career develop. But, yeah, he'll have a nice crowd there. He'll want to win uh, to get his team back on track. And, uh, you know, they're going to stay around in Atlanta for a little while, practice at Georgia Tech because they uh, go to London next week. So they'll, uh, you know, he's going to get to stick around in his hometown for a little while here and hang out. I know he'd like to do it with the win, but uh, uh, maybe the Falcons can mess up his homecoming for him. Let me ask you this. Uh, you know, I have to ask you a Julio question every week. He had a nice game against the the Cardinals and uh, didn't have a touchdown, but Larry Fitzgerald was heard, mic'd up that that's the best. He's the best to ever do it. Talking about Julio, the best I've ever seen is what Fitzgerald said. Um, do you think there's any regret by the Falcons about giving him that extension? No, um, the only regret would be that they should have did it sooner. Because, I mean, I was able to figure out the amount right away yeah uh and i'm not a capologist and, and it ended up a little bit higher six million dollars higher than the three year 60 that you know the sports writer could figure out um so because i'm thinking you know they pay me right right away it took them two years to pay julio it took them two years to pay grady and so the locker room you know we're looking for all kind of reasons for why they're playing this bad so the locker room's probably going well hey what what took them so long to well, what, how are they going to pay me if it took them so long to pay Julio, took them so long to pay Grady, uh, and maybe there's some disconnect in the brotherhood. We knew that money was going uh, eventually in the brotherhood, but we don't we don't know when, and we may be seeing the beginning of that because, uh, you know, it's, it's, these are talented players that they handpick for this team, mm -hmm. and they're not playing in it. Yeah, you've alluded to that before, and that's kind of what I was thinking. You feel like the way this – contract situation with Julio went on and with the way the Falcons handled their training camp that it's really impacted this season that you, you've got a strong opinion on that don't you yeah I you know because uh the psyche of the team is so uh fragile and important and the one thing that boosts the locker room is when guys get get paid uh but you know I don't know if they were haggling about it or waiting on cash flow issues but uh, you know, now you got, you know, about 10, 15 guys lined up that know they're, there's not any money left. So, you know, how hard are they going to play? I mean, uh, psychologically, when they know they're uh, on their last days here and they're talking about family this and family that, and they, you know, Austin Hooper can't even pay him. He's about on pace for 112 uh, yeah. catches. Devondre Campbell, who had been a solid player, is all of a sudden missing tackles all over the place. He knows he can't get any money here. So, uh, you know, uh, I think it is a ripple effect. It's a theory I can't write about, but I can talk about it uh, until I get somebody on the record uh, validating that uh, premise. Wow. Uh, all right. The Falcons went straight from Houston to Arizona, so they were gone a week. They're back in, back in town, obviously. At Orlando, give us and the, and the Falcons fans out here listening, just, just you've covered a lot of teams. You've covered good teams. You've covered bad teams. Uh, this team's on the run. The head coach is uh, running out of out of rope in terms of uh, having any any slack. Uh, he's the defensive coordinator. The defense is atrocious, uh, as you said. There seem to be some just some issues within the team. The brotherhood certainly has fractured. Um, what's it like around this team right now? What's the atmosphere? Is there any positivity at all to be taken away? Uh, no, it's pretty much a minefield, and it's early in the year uh, for that. Uh, you know, the pros are being pros. Uh, Matt Ryan's a pro, uh, you know, and he's doing his thing. Uh, uh, Adrian Claiborne, Ricardo Allen. But, you know, other guys like Deion Jones is, you know, declining interviews saying he's got to go to the training room during media time, and then he doesn't go. He just stands there. So, mm -hmm. you know, we have to turn him into the, uh, you know, um, team officials. And then, you know, if it gets – worse we'll go to the league officials but some of these guys are not being stand-up guys and, and uh you know you got to lead through the good times and the bad you know just because you don't like some uh somebody wrote or said about you on social media uh you know we're seeing some of these new era kids not 
uh, you know, uh, stand up and uh, be accountable and so forth. I see Campbell out there tweeting back at people uh, just, you know, because they criticize his play and so forth. So, you know, these kids are kind of more thin-skinned than the old pros, uh, but hopefully they'll just be, uh, you know, um, going through a maturation process and, and grow up uh, and, you know, be accountable. I mean, you're an all-pro player. When you were going to the Pro Bowl, nobody was – you wasn't, you didn't have any problem talking to everybody. So, But now you lose a couple of games and you're upset. Last couple of minutes with D. Orlando Ledbetter from the uh, Atlanta Journal-Constitution, AJC.com, Falcons beat writer. You know Arthur Blank pretty well. I, from what I've been able to gather, uh, reading your stuff for so many years, you've got a good relationship with him. I don't know him, but he appears to me to be a fabulous owner, a gentleman loves his players. If anything, I think sometimes he makes emotional decisions, and that's what I was asking about Julio. I mean, I look at this league, and and the organizations that make emotional decisions or pay guys based on what they've done and not what they're doing now or what they can do in the future, the ones that get in trouble. The, you know, Belichick doesn't do that, as you know. And when it's time for Brady to go, he'll call Brady in and say, hey, do you want to do this on your own, or do we have to let you go? I mean, he's never making a decision based on emotion. He's only making it on what's best for the team. I get the sense maybe with the Falcons that's not the case, and as, and maybe Arthur Blake is is got a soft spot for for players. Am I is this criticism unfair, or do you think there's some truth to it? Yeah, it uh, it goes back to uh, Arthur Blank pushing Michael Vick around in the chair when he had the uh, broken foot that year, and uh, since then he's tried to distance himself from the players a little bit more. But when he comes out and tells players they're going to be Falcons for life. You know, that puts your uh, money people in a bad situation. So, uh, you know, uh, one of the things moving forward is can he make those decisions uh, that are going to be for the best interest of the football part of the operation? And will he separate the business side of it? You know, when the uh, PSLs are not moving, the stadium's gone, you know, fans are not coming to the game. Um, The reason they're not coming is because they're not winning. So can he see a path? back to winning by firing the coach or do you stay with the coach with some alterations he's already tried that uh, a couple times and it seems like now it'd be to move forward in a new direction uh, would be certainly an option on this table so was it blank and dimitrov that wanted uh, quinn to be his own defensive coordinator because i'll be honest with you I, and i think you feel the same way in this league I just don't see it. I mean, being a head coach is a, is a full time job, and now all of a sudden you're trying to call the defense. That, that just seems uh, unusual to me, and I don't see why any organization would want their head coach to take that on. Yeah, I, I think it was Coach Quinn. I, I talked to some a long term Falcons around here that think he's been angling to do this from the day one. You know, he got rid of his first coordinator 13 games into the season. You know, Richard Williams. Uh, uh, an older coach, linebacker coach who had never been a coordinator. So, you know, he'd been wanting to call his defense from the very beginning. He gave it to his best, well, one of his best friends, or at least thought to be, who had never been a coordinator. So, you know, he was going to always have a say in that. And so he just went on on, went on and took it over anyway. They say he's been calling it anyway from since he's been here. Uh, and that would explain some of him, the uh, other head coaching issues that have cropped up with time management and timeouts and so forth. So, you know, it seemed like it was a, a big um, breakthrough for him last week to, to win the toss and, and give the ball to the offense. Uh, he had <laughs> never done that before. <laughs> he was like, oh, that's oh, that's new. <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd avoid putting that defense out there as much as I could as well. I, I saw something today. I think it was on your Twitter feed. But Brian Baldinger, former NFL lineman, breaks down tape and, and, and so forth. And – uh he put out a, a, a goal line situation with the Cardinals and the Falcons defense right there on like the two yard line was just totally, uh, the alignment was just a complete failure. And he was asking the question, rightfully so, how in the NFL do you not even line up correctly in this situation? Uh, pretty sure that was on your Twitter feed. I mean, that, yeah. that, 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 that looks bad. That's a bad look for the Falcons defensive coaching staff. Yeah. Somebody's got to call timeout on the field. Uh, you know, uh, uh, shoot, when my five-year-olds line up crazy like that, which they're going to do, they're five, uh, you know, you got extra timeouts just for that. But uh, uh, it's a goal line. You got to, you know, you a six front or eight, you got to match each gap. And uh, Falcons had a, a two gaps just wide open. Dion sitting in the end zone. And I guess, I don't, I don't know what that was. That was bizarre. <laughs> 
All right, you always uh, make a prediction for us. This has been a tough season for the Falcons. Uh, of course, the Rams are just as motivated because uh, you you mentioned they made the deal for Jalen Ramsey. Uh, they're all in with this team trying to get back to the Super Bowl. So this is a huge game for them, too. They don't want to fall to three and four. Falcons to have any chance, any chance to salvage this season. They got to win. How do you see this one playing out Sunday inside Mercedes-Benz Stadium? I, I keep wanting to pick the Falcons, but uh, I, I can't see – uh, them controlling Aaron Donald and the fact that, uh, you know, Jared Goff and them are coming off a game where they only threw for 78 yards. Uh, they got the sixth rated pass uh, offense against the 27th rated pass defense. So I'm thinking Cooper Cope, Robert Woods, and Brandon Cooks are going to be open all day long. And this is going to be another long day at the Mercedes Benz Stadium for the Falcons. Yeah, I kind of agree with you, unfortunately. I just don't see this Falcons defense slowing anybody down. All right, folks. So one thing that makes uh, Orlando such an outstanding professional football beat writer is, uh, and it sometimes upsets Falcons fans, but believe me, uh, to, to have someone to cover a team, you don't want a fanboy. You want somebody to shoot it straight. Uh, Orlando's as good as I've ever read at doing that. If it up, if it ruffles some feathers, so be it. If you want to follow the Falcons, you want to follow Orlando. Tell them how they can do it. Well, on our, on our AJC.com, our Falcons page, and then we t- send everything out via our Twitter account at D Orlando AJC and our Facebook page, Atlanta Falcons News Now. Enjoyed it. Maybe next week. Maybe the Falcons will surprise us. Maybe next week we'll visit under under better circumstances. Thanks, Orlando. All right. Thank you, Gary. Have a great one.